Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this Friday evening. My name is Amber Watson. I'm the Director of Academic Advising, and I'll be helping moderate the session for questions and answers towards the end. But first, you're going to hear from a variety of faculty and students to tell you about our psychology program. Uh, we will have lots of time for questions and answers, so you can put those in the box at any point. Um, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Bex. He's the chair of the psychology department, and he's going to get us started tonight. Thank you, Amber, and, and welcome everyone to our discussion panel. Um, we hope you're as excited about psychology as we are. Um, psychology really is at the heart of everything we do, and um, the immense reach of psychology is reflected by the interests and research areas of our faculty. Our faculty interests span the molecular and cellular level, and fa uh, faculty in this area include Dr. Brenhouse, who's here today. Um, I study uh, psychology at a systems level. Um, others, including Dr. Chizeski and uh, Dr. Sharp here, study personal, uh, interpersonal interactions and social levels and uh, population levels. So we really span a range. And this is also reflected in the kinds of methodologies that we use in our department. They include microscopic studies, electrophysiological studies, um, imaging at the cellular level and microscopic level, fMRI looking at whole brain activity, and, and people use behavioral studies as well. Um, and these, these foci, the foci of our interests uh, are, are similarly diverse. People study uh, translational and applied research. Um, Dawn and William are interested in mental health problems. Um, I'm interested in clinical vision science, people who lose their vision because of different eye diseases. Other people in the, in the department are interested in how health and exercise affect attention and learning and memory and so on. Uh, others are interested in effective science and um, uh, emotional health. And um, others are interested in how uh, responsible decision making affects our, our uh, responsibility for our environment. So um, we really cover a lot of methods and a lot of interests, and we're really looking forward to um, teaching you about what we do. We're looking forward to seeing you here. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to our associate chair, Dawn Chizeski. Welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. First, I want to just congratulate everyone. Um, one, on your upcoming high school graduation. Um, that's quite an achievement, especially during a pandemic. Um, and especially congratulating you on your acceptance into Northeastern, which is, you know, a very competitive school to get into. So congratulations. Um, so I'm just going to show a few slides. And uh, first, we're going to start with a video of our department. And then I'm going to go into a little bit more about what the psychology major looks like. Um, and then I will pass it off to Dr. Sharp to talk about his dialogue of civilization in London. So let me share my screen. The overall theme of research and teaching in the psychology department is the study of mind, brain, and behavior. And within this general theme, we have four main faculty research areas. These are behavioral neuroscience, personality and social psychology, language and cognition, and perception. I mean, it's been known for a long time that what you see influences what you feel. But the idea that what you feel could literally influence your visual system, I think is a very unique and innovative question. We generally study emotion. We study um, the nature of emotion. So what is it that your brain and your body are doing when you have a feeling of anger or sadness or fear? And how do you know what feeling you're having? How is it represented to you? How can you tell? methods from vision science, like continuous flash suppression. Uh, we also take a lot of physiological measures. I look at uh, the way that body signals or body states um, can influence things like affect, but also influence things like perception. Um, so I'm also interested in uh, something called interoception, uh, which is your ability to uh, detect changes in your body state. 
what happens to the brains of those animals? How do they respond later? And are their brains changed in ways that reflect their, their increased in escalated aggression or animal models of violence? I've learned all about their, their animal model related to the brain areas that Professor Maloney has been researching for the past 20 years or so. I've learned how to do injections on the animals. I'm working on learning how to do perfusions. Um, it's just been a really great comprehensive learning experience. Color vision is the main focus of my research, and I do this with behavioral methods, studying perceptual phenomena. I use uh, mathematical modeling based upon data we collect perceptually to try to understand those processes. In my lab, we um, look at how people think. We're doing developmental work, how thinking changes over time. And in particular, um, how development is affected by environment. So we're looking at how urban, suburban, and rural children reason about plants and animals. One of the biggest things that Professor Chloe's lab has shown me is what it's like to be a graduate student and what it's like to be a professor. So um, having the opportunity to be in a lab, I get to work closely with himself as well as the graduate students. And working on my own project gives me, to a lesser extent, the idea of how it is to have a project going on in a lab and understanding everything that goes into just one research project. My research is interested in how stress affects the brain. And within that, I'm interested in sex differences and how ovarian hormones can interact with stress hormones to uh, cause sex-specific changes in females. Right now, we're looking at uh, how emotions affect risk judgments and threat detection, how it affects uh, the formation of trust, and actually how it affects uh, intergroup interactions and how it inflames prejudice. One of the projects we're really into is looking at how should I determine if I can trust you or not? And from uh, lots of rationales, it makes sense that the human mind should be able to detect this. And so we're looking for what are the signals everybody's looking at? Is it the shifty eyes? Is it the smile? And no one can find what it is. Well, we use robots because with our collaborators at MIT, they have wonderful humanoid robots that we can control with high precision exactly every motion they use. And so it's a great scientific tool for us to, to study which cues, which movements matter. I think my experience at Northeastern both uh, in the lab working with Dave and throughout the rest of the program has really prepared me well for uh, an academic career in the future. Undergraduates in our program benefit from doing research in faculty laboratories where they learn cutting edge research techniques in a hand-on setting. And we also offer a wide variety of co-op opportunities in both research and clinical settings. It has definitely proved very beneficial as far as how to interact with people in a lab, how to conduct yourself in a lab, techniques that would be ideal to know how to do if I decided down the line to get a lab technician job. Graduate training plays a critical role in our department. We offer a full-time PhD program, and we've structured the program so that grad students work very closely with faculty in their research labs. When you want to define emotion as My lab is a very collaborative place. Mm -hmm. Students often collaborate with each other on projects. Um, that I'm directing, but, but really um, where we allow collaborations to kind of form organically. No other university is moving the way Northeastern is. It's really, it's expanding. The quality of education and research here is growing exponentially. It's just a really exciting place to be. Okay, so as that video showed, there's lots of different areas um, within psychology. And that's the, I think the wonderful aspect of our major is that it's a very flexible major and no two psychology majors look alike because it, psychology is related to everything. You would, I'd be hard pressed to find something that psychology isn't related to. And so people kind of develop their own path within the major. Some people are interested in clinical work. Some people are interested in the business. Some people are pursuing a medical degree. Um, so people are pursuing law, um, criminal justice. So we have a variety of courses and there are certain courses that you have to take like our foundations course or statistics course. Um, but after that, there's a lot of flexibility where you kind of choose your own path. Um, and even within our major, you are required to pick three classes 
that are not psychology classes, but relate to psychology. Um, and that's another way where people like incorporate their minor interests and other areas. Um, so that I think is one of the benefits of our psychology major is that you really tailor it to what you want um, and to pursue the interests that you have. Um, so we have a variety of courses. There's biological, social, clinical, um, and um, within that, as you're aware, I'm sure, because that's probably why you apply to Northeastern, there's a lot of co-op experiences. And people often ask me, well, which co-ops do psych majors go on? And my answer is all of them, because again, psych is related to everything. So we have psych majors doing uh, business and human resources co-ops, um, other people doing research, some people you know, working in a prison. Um, so there's a many different co-ops um, that, again, you can tailor your specific interests to. And later during our student panel, they will uh, show you some of the co-ops and we'll discuss some of the co-ops that they've been on. Um, and you'll see that it's very different for each and uh, every one of them. And so in addition to you know, the classwork, you get your co-op experience, which then you integrate back into your classwork. But then we also have many different learning experiences. So, and um, Dr. Brenhouse is gonna talk more about the directed study in labs, how to get research experience, um, which our employers, our co-op employers love because it's teaching you how to think critically and analytically. Um, and they really, really love that in our students. Um, our seminars where these are higher level courses where again, you get to choose the path in which seminar you wanna take. Um, but the, here we're really, you know, they're a class of 19 or less. You get to know your peers, you get to know your instructors um, at, and really delve into a certain area such as biological psychology and read the current literature on that. And then, especially with technology advancing and the pandemic, um, we are offering different int integrative ways to teach as well. And so some of our professors are teaching in a flipped classroom model where you listen, like for example, I teach abnormal psychology and you listen to my lectures online, but in class, that's where we you know, really engage and watch videos and discuss case studies and have discussions and debates. So you're doing like the academic work and the homework outside of class, and we're really engaged in class. In addition to our straight psychology major, we've also developed several combined majors throughout the years. Um, and these are just a, a, a list of our current ones and we keep building them. Um, and economics and psychology is one of our popular ones. Health science and psychology is very popular right now, criminal justice. Um, we've just created a music and psychology one and a human service and psychology one um, for this coming fall. And we're pursuing maybe a psychology and political science one. Um, so again, these are other ways to tailor your specific interest in psychology um, on your academic path. And if you have any questions, um, there's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. You know, I'm here all the time in my house because of the pandemic, so I am craving <laughs> interaction with human beings. So please feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any questions about any aspect of our psychology major. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Dr. Sharp, who's going to talk about his Dialogue of Civilization, the first Dialogue of Civilization created for the psychology department, um, where he takes students to London. And it sounds like a really fun time. All right, so um, welcome everybody. And uh, I think some of you may not have even had a chance to come onto our campus to see it yet, but uh, I'm gonna talk about when you get here, also considering going and doing something globally like going to London. Um, so imagine yourself coming to campus and then in the summer of 2022, uh, going abroad to study some uh, I specifically look at, and I'll just move the slide along here, um, specifically personality and abnormal psychology. So this is the inaugural class that we sent in, let's see, 20, 2018, yeah, 2018. And uh, we have done this program in 2019. In 2020, we pivoted to a virtual model. So everybody was 
um, in their various homes and the speakers kind of zoomed in to us. And that's actually what we're going to be also doing in 2021. But the hope is that people will consider in 2022 traveling back to London. And it's a really interesting kind of way to study two major courses that actually for majors meet uh, the what we call area A social and personality uh, section of the major. Um, so you get to be abroad, you get to be in a much smaller class. Um, usually I limit the number of students that I take to about uh, 20 to 25. Um, it is competitive, so you do have to apply um, to uh, go on the dialogue, but I think it's really worth it. And certainly something, again, if you're a, a major, consider uh, applying right away. Um, while we're there, we have um, agreements and contracts with the Freud Museum uh, in London. So we talk about kind of the beginning of thinking about applying psychological principles to helping people with mental health. We visit Still Point Spaces. It's actually a, an international company that happens to have a clinic and a lab set up in London, but they're also in Berlin, Paris, and a couple of other places. But it's a, it's a working clinic. And so uh, therapists are there. We get to meet with some of the therapists who work there get to hear about cases and how the difference between uh, the UK's national healthcare system thinks about and treats mental illness versus uh, the one that many people are familiar with, with, which is the one that we have, of course, here in the United States. Um, we, we visit uh, a number of institutes, including the Institute of Psychoanalysis, and most students really find this kind of fascinating to delve a little bit deeper uh, into this. Um, we, of course, also do have a good time, like Dr. Szeski mentioned, so we do visit things like Christchurch and Oxford, we do tours of London, um, the Florence Nightingale Museum, uh, and we have a certain number of meals together as well, just to kind of uh, keep a social aspect to everything, but you're you're living in London, you're taking classes in London, and again, students just find this to be um, kind of an interesting way to round out their uh, Northeastern time, and I really want to encourage people, like, as you're thinking about coming to Northeastern, think about also having that abroad experience. I think along with the, the co-op, it's, it's, if not already rapidly becoming kind of one of the other signature programs at Northeastern. And uh, we devote a lot of time to really thinking about having good outcomes. And I believe if nothing else, this pandemic has shown that we are all connected globally. And so studying and being aware um, of how we're connected, I just think it's more important than ever. So um, I, I guess at the q and I'll be happy to answer any questions about the dialogue. But when you come here, certainly, um, start you know thinking about planning out your courses and consider taking uh those two very important major courses psych major courses uh with me in london in 2022 and with that uh I turn it back to you dr Szeski. yeah thank you dr sharp i totally agree with him i never went abroad in my college years, and I regret that. Um, so that I definitely there's and so there's so many different ways to do that in Northeastern. The dialogue of civilization is one. Raina is going to talk about how she created her own co-op in Italy. Um, so that's another way. So there's plenty of opportunities. Right now, I'm going to uh, give this over to Dr. Brenhouse to talk about the different research opportunities for undergrads here at, uh, in our psychology department. Thank you very much. I am very excited to um, speak to all of you. Um, make sure I'm in the right space here. There we go. So, right, I am Professor Heather Brenhouse. I direct the Developmental Neuropsychobiology Laboratory here at Northeastern. And I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about all of the opportunities for psychology research experienced here uh, on the Northeastern campus as an undergraduate. Our department has an extremely active and really very innovative research presence on campus and really throughout the world, if you account for all of our research collaborators. Uh, here on campus, our research spans a wide swath of psychology disciplines uh, with an even wider range, range of techniques uh, and, research, and research methods. 
one thing that we all have in common though, all the labs is that we rely on you, our undergraduates to keep our research running smoothly. Um, the principal investigators together with senior lab members like graduate students and postdocs work closely. With, we work really closely with our undergraduates in our labs to design experiments, to perform the data, collect, uh, the data collections, uh, to troubleshoot along the way. Um, and together, um, you know, undergraduates uh, wind up co-authoring uh, many papers um, in resulting publications. And really, these are really invaluable ways for you to connect with your professors and to connect with the research world and to really learn through experience. So I really can't stress enough uh, how, uh, you know, how many opportunities there are and how important it is for you to, um, to really engage in those opportunities because it's, I think it's really kind of the lifeblood of your, of your psychology experience and your psychology education. So there's a number of ways that you can get involved in research here at Northeastern. One way is through directed study. Um, or independent study, which these, these actually count for course credit. And they wind up being just an agreement uh, between you and the professor who directs the lab. Uh, work study positions are also available, which um, are research assistants, uh, research assistantships that are paid positions through federal work study um, funds for those that are eligible. Um, and you know, finally, students often just reach out, reach out to professors for volunteer positions and to volunteer in their lab as research assistants. We have many volunteers in my lab that come back semester after semester, often growing into senior members that wind up running their own studies uh, with first authorships on papers, poster presentations, and conferences. And they wind up graduating often with honors in a discipline after, pre uh, after preparing a, an honors thesis um, uh, in, their, in their junior or senior year. So as I said, the research labs uh, span a wide breadth of disciplines, but uh, all of them really are places where our undergraduates have a tremendous impact on our research. I really can't, um, I really can't emphasize uh, enough how important undergraduates are in our research. We really just couldn't get it done without, um, without folks just like you. Um, and you know, in return, you, know, you as students really get pretty enviable uh, experiences. Um, so I can just give you a few examples of some of the research opportunities that we have here on campus. Uh, the Center for Cognitive and Effective Brain Health, their researchers use MRI imaging and physiological measures together with behavioral assessments to design biofeedback strategies, um, predictive diagnostic tools to treat disorders like schizophrenia, anxiety, prevention of aging-related uh, age -related, uh, cognitive problems. The Translational Vision Lab is another lab where, uh, that works to develop tests and therapies that assist in the diagnosis and treatment of people with developmental eye disease in the young or aging eye disease in the elderly. They use technologies like EEG and eye tracking. Um, our behavioral neuroscience laboratories investigate brain development. We investigate the impacts of early life experiences and brain circuits controlling fear in animal models. Uh, these labs, we use uh, high resolution microscopy techniques. We use genetic engineering, state of the art molecular assays to answer really important mechanistic questions to help develop interventions that are targeted to individuals based on age and sex and experience. So. Um, we also have uh, cognition laboratories that investigate cognitive processes in people. For example, how we organize our thoughts and ideas to use the things that we don't know to help us make guesses about the things that we, um, uh, things that, I'm sorry, we've used ideas of things that we do know to help make guesses about things that we don't know um, or the other way around. So these are just some examples of how many uh, types of ex really exciting research questions our labs in psychology are working on to answer uh, and that you as our undergraduates can, can be a part of. So I really encourage you to, to come and look for these opportunities because there are many of them um, and you'll really get a lot out of it. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over back, I guess, to Dr. Suzeski. Thank you, Dr. Brenhouse. Um, Yes, I mean, I, I think this, the opportunities for undergrad research here at Northeastern University, I think just sets us apart from so many other um, programs out there. When students graduate and you're gonna hear about their experiences, their like resumes or CVs are like better than mine was when I was graduating from my doctoral program. Um, it's just so impressive, the opportunities that they have here at Northeastern that they're able to do, so. 
Um, and again, one of the other reasons why I love Northeastern is that they have psychology in the College of Science um, instead of humanities, um, because we are a science and this, you know, the research opportunities in our labs, you know, help you, you know, to further advance that science. Okay. So now I have the distinct privilege of introducing you to Raina Levin, one of our students who's think graduating this year, sadly for me, um, a good for her. And um, so she, you will see, she's gonna just show you some of the experiences that she's had while she's been here at Northeastern um, throughout the year. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Raina. All right, um, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you all see this okay? Great, okay. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Raina. Um, I am a senior at Northeastern, fifth year, graduating this semester, um, which is very weird to say out loud. Um, so I'm going to walk through sort of one, um, one way that a Northeastern psychology experience could go. And this, okay, uh, sorry, this PowerPoint's a little weird. I'm taking me a second. Um, so like we've talked about, there's a lot of different ways to have a Northeastern psychology experience. So again, mine is just one possibility. Um, so a little about me, I'm a fifth year psychology major. I have minors in biology and Spanish. I'm from Miami, Florida. So Boston winters were a bit of an adjustment for me. Um, I am involved in a dance group on campus, um, love to read, bake. And if you have a dog, I'm slightly jealous of you right now, especially during this pandemic. Um, Here's a picture of me from a few years ago. We'll get to that later. Um, all right, so some of the things that I want to touch upon in this, and you might hear me repeat a lot throughout this presentation. One, it is fully okay if you don't know yet what you want to do in your life, in your college career. I think it's really easy to walk into college feeling like you have to have it figured out. You know, it's a, it's a process. It's something that takes a lot to work through. So if you want to go into the psychology program, but you're not sure exactly what yet, that is fine. Um, I'm also gonna talk quite a bit about research. I've worked in a few different labs. And as uh, Dr. Sosowski mentioned earlier about travel. Um, so Northeastern has quite a few different study abroad programs. One like Dr. Sharp discussed is a dialogue of civilizations, a short summer study abroad program, usually around four to six weeks long where you take two classes. There's also full semester study abroad programs. Um, and also you can co-op in another country and I have done all of these things. So we'll talk about each of them in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to walk through chronologically. Um, when I came into Northeastern my freshman year, like I said, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was trying to decide between a few different possible tracks I wasn't sure if I wanted to be BNS, which is behavioral neuroscience or more uh, psychology based. So I sort of did a little bit of both sides. I did, you know, chemistry classes all the way through organic chemistry just to test that out. Um, but also I really appreciated that within the psych major, I was able to do that. You know, I was able to see, is this what I want? Do I want to stick to these bio and chem classes and try that realm. Um, I also got to explore. I uh, got pretty involved with the American Sign Language program at Northeastern, really strong department and Boston has a very strong deaf community if you're interested. Um, and my freshman year is actually when I first started out in research. Um, so my second semester freshman year, I did a directed study at a, camp, a lab on campus called the Interdisciplinary Effective Science Lab, uh, which studies emotion and some of the research I did happened to focus on language and emotion. And actually that, if you were here at the beginning of a presentation, was one of the labs that was uh, in that video. So it was kind of cool to see that from some years ago. Uh, so that really started me off with research. I was there my second semester freshman year, directed study, and then the following year, first semester, I continued to volunteer there, um, was able to you know, get the experience of presenting a poster and being involved in research. So it was definitely the start of my growth within the psych department. 
Um, then the summer after my freshman year, I actually went on a dialogue of civilizations. It was focused on Spanish language and Argentinian culture. It was in Argent Argentina and Uruguay. Um, and this is actually a picture from the very south of Argentina, Patagonia. Props to my very old iPhone 5 for this picture. Um, but that was really my first experience getting to travel sort of not entirely on my own because I was with a group of Northeastern students and a Northeastern professor, but I got to really experience travel for myself. So there was lots of time to explore um, classes and learning, but also to sort of test out the waters. And that led to a few experiences down the line for me. So the following year, so this is sort of a cross between my second and third year at Northeastern. Um, my second semester of my sophomore year, I did my first co-op. I was still, as you might be able to tell from the flies, uh, sort of figuring out what path I wanted my psychology career to take, whether I wanted to, to be more medical, biological. Um, and so I decided what better way than to test it out by working in it for six months. And so my first co-op was at a basic neurobiology lab um, so looking at molecular level at Harvard Medical School, and we worked with flies as our animal model. So got very, very good fine motor skills from that experience, dissecting tiny little fruit fly brains. Um, in the corner there, I actually have a picture of a confocal microscopy scan of one lobe of a fly brain. Um, so it was a really powerful learning experience. It was very different than what I'd done before and taught me a lot because one of the good things with co-op is you learn not only what you wanna do, but also what you don't. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad experience, but I think it's really good to be able to walk out of something and say, maybe I don't wanna spend the rest of my life hanging out with flies. Um, and so it, you know, taught me quite a bit about neuroscience, about research, and I'm very glad I had that experience, but it, it taught me moving forward more what I wanted to look for. And uh, so right after that, I went for a completely different experience, and I decided after doing my dialogue in Argentina that I wanted to get to do a little bit more of an immersive study abroad experience and really pursue working on my Spanish skills. And so I did a full semester study abroad program in Lima, Peru. I was there for five months, uh, direct enrolled in a university in Lima. So I took all of my classes in Spanish with local students. Um, and it was absolutely amazing to take psychology classes there. I got to take a cultural psychology class um, where we were discussing different groups in the Amazon, uh, which is not something I could have gotten in the US. I took an archeology span class um, and that really was a very immersed uh, program. I mean, I was living with a host family, my life was in Spanish, and it was nice to be able to experience something that, you know, you don't often get to just pick up and move to a different life for five months. Um, taught me a lot about independence, about how to adjust to an entirely new environment. Um, and when I got back to Northeastern, I stayed involved with study abroad. I started working for our study abroad office, which is called the Global Experience Office. Um, I declared a Spanish minor because I was like a class away from getting one after doing these and realized I got pretty interested in some linguistics classes too. So as you can see, exploring quite a few different directions with the flexibility of the psych department. And oh, I forgot, I also have a little picture of Machu Picchu there. Um, all right, so then the travel continued. Um, the uh, summer after my third year, um, I went on a second dialogue, actually. Um, it was studying climate change science and policy with a civil engineering professor at Northeastern. Um, and we went through India and Nepal um, and while I was there, really discovered, though it wasn't like the central message of the dialogue, that I was pretty excited about public health and how infrastructure really affects that. Um, 
health infrastructure, cities, but also mental health. And so it was a really nice melding of that that I wanted to explore a little bit more. I also was at this point, perhaps a little bit addicted to travel. And so for my second co-op, I wanted to do one in another country. And the way co-op works, normally uh, there is a co-op database that you can look into, apply to jobs that already exist. It's a really great way to get started. But let's say you go through this database and don't find what you're looking for, you can make your own. And so I cold emailed a lab that I found in Italy. They got back to me and uh, I spent my second co-op working in Milan, Italy. And uh, it was a really interesting place. It was a neuro-linguistics research lab, lots of neuroimaging, so we used fMRI. Um, and it studied the cognitive benefits of bilingualism, especially with aging. Um, and uh, I was there until December 2019. Um, I learned quite a lot. It was almost ironic to walk into this bilingualism lab, given I did not speak Italian when I arrived. So, um, you know, I could not participate in their experiments as a non-Italian English bilingual, but once again, really putting myself in a situation where I was adapting to experiences very different from what I could have found. Um, you know, and in this case, it wasn't with a study abroad program, it was just me in Italy in this, in this little lab. Uh, there were like four other people there. So it was absolutely a really good growth opportunity. And um, when I got back to Northeastern, I continued working for our global experience office, um, having done basically the full breadth of uh, opportunities they offer. I also really continued staying involved in health uh, through a global health class at Northeastern um, and actually was planning to, uh, I had designed a project for that summer to look into HPV vaccination. Um, in Kenya through a professor at Northeastern. There's a department called uh, Undergraduate Research and Fellowships that can help fund independent projects. And so um, unfortunately this project was scheduled for summer 2020. So didn't quite pan out, um, but you know, we've all adapted. <laughs> so that brings us to right now. I am now in my fifth year. Um, and as I'm sure all of you are well accustomed to living a virtual life, we've been to. Um, so I did my third co-op uh, remotely entirely. So actually haven't seen the place where I worked, um, but um, I am actually still working there part-time as I finished my last semester of undergrad, but I was working at the Harvard Aging Brain Study, am working there. <laughs> Uh, which is at Mass General Hospital, um, which studies the development of Alzheimer's disease over time, um, looking to see sort of how that develops um, and also what we can do in the future to combat it. Um, and actually, you know, it's been remote, but it's still been a great experience um, and given me more opportunities for research, given me a sense of clinical research. I actually had a meeting today that, you know, I might be writing a paper with this lab moving forward. So lots of opportunities if you're interested in research. I also, um, over the course of this year, this virtual life was um, a peer mentor for a program for freshmen who uh, were starting their first semester of Northeastern while staying in their home countries. So helping build community for people who weren't here yet physically, but also were very much part of the Northeastern community. And also I'm a teaching assistant uh, for Dr. Brenhouse's class, Brain Behavior and Immunity. Uh, if you do come to Northeastern, highly recommend that class. I took it a year ago and I'm really enjoying getting to revisit the material as a TA. Um, all right, I think I've been talking for a minute, so I'm going to try to talk quickly now, but Moving forward, um, I am graduating this semester. So that uncertainty comes back. Um, I am planning longer term to pursue a master in public health, perhaps in epidemiology. I've um, been really curious about continuing to look at patterns in health. Um, and so right now I'm planning to work for a couple years before then, 
I'm in the thick of a job application process for a few different positions, some in clinical research, uh, some with public health organizations across the country. I'm in a couple, I'm a couple steps into a, a application process with a fellowship for the CDC. So we'll hopefully hear more about that uh, this coming week. And you know, it's a, it's a work in progress still, but I'm excited to see what the next step is. And actually this picture is um, from my fire escape of my current department in Boston, sort of a looking forward, looking into the city of Boston view right there. And a couple other photos, just things I didn't touch on so much. I talked a whole lot about leaving Boston, but I also really love this city. So that top photo is um, the sunset over the Charles River. Um, it's been raining today, so we didn't get to go find a sunset, but uh, it's a really beautiful city. Um, on the bottom left, um, I actually led a spring break uh, service trip um, a little over a year ago. Uh, yep, the, the spring break right before in 2020. Uh, and so that is a picture of the group that I led in the Mojave Desert was sort of an environmental conservation trip. And then on the bottom right, that is a picture of my dance group when we had in-person shows. We're still going strong virtually and have a show in a week. So, you know, the community persists even as we've all adjusted this year. And I think with that, I'm going to slow my speech down and say thank you guys for listening to me talk. Um, there'll be more of a panel for questions after this. So thank you guys so much. Irena, uh, again, very impressive. Um, now I just want you to introduce the other students, if you just want to wave your hand and say hi, um, who are on our panel today. Again, all of them are have very different uh, academic paths, but all stellar just the same as Irena's. Um, so there's Marina Wilson, who's currently in my developmental seminar um, on aging, who's doing fabulous. Um, Carter Lang, who is, I believe, the psych club president? Yes, you are. Um, and was in a normal psych class. And we have Dor Pearl, um, who is in, I believe, our diversity and inclusion committee in the psychology department. Um, so with that, I am going to open it up for questions. And Amber, if you want to moderate, um, we'll all take. Yeah, we have a few questions waiting for us. So I'll go ahead and um, get those started. So the first question is for Dr. Sharp. Uh, can you tell us when students would apply for the Dialogue of Civilization um, for your program in particular? Sure. Um, so the applications usually go live uh, the end of November. And um, the deadline is usually for early decision is, the, is in January. Um, and it, it usually involves three or four essay questions. And one of them is like, why and what is it that is appealing? So things to start thinking about. Great, thank you so much. Uh, just to piggyback on that, there's other ones that are psych related too. I know um, human services have a one in Croatia um, with cross-cultural psychology, I forget the other one. Um, and just a little hint, if you really wanna go on Dr. Sharp's dialogue, he likes red velvet cake. Are we, um suggesting that he can be bribed for a dialogue spot. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> um, this one is for uh, Dr. Szeski. Can you talk, you mentioned flexibility when you talked about the degree program, particularly for the solid psychology major. Can you talk a little bit about how students get um, a little taste of a lot of areas and then can also kind of focus on, on what they're interested in? Yes. Um, so like as Raina said, you are not expected to know what you want to do for the rest of your life at the age of 18. That's just, it doesn't make sense. Of course, you're not going to know. Um, so with the psychology major, we do create that flexibility, but we also kind of force some exploration on you. Um, so as I think Dr. Sharp said before, there's an area A kind of course at an area B, where area A is more so personal and social and clinical kind of area, and then area B, which is biological and cognitive. Um, and so you have to take two area A's and two area B's. Um, and some people just want to do all area A, some people just want to do all area B. I know when I was a psych major, I wanted to do all area B, but my school made me 
choose, you know, and take some courses in area B. I didn't think I would like anything to do with biological psychology. And because I was forced to take that area B course, I am now a neuropsychologist. Um, so I kind of awaken my passion because sometimes you don't know what your passion is until you kind of have that opportunity to explore. So as you explore these different areas, then you start to get a feel of, oh, I really do like this. Sometimes there's students come in and say, you know, I really want to go the clinical track. I'm not interested in really doing research. And then again, you're required to do research and all of a sudden they find their passion in research. Um, so as you start to, you know, travel down that path, you're going to start to find out where your passion is. And that's when you can then start to, you know, make your path a little bit more specialized. Um, and sometimes it's a winding path. I think Dr. Brandhaus can talk about her winding path. Um, myself and Dr. Sharp can talk about our winding path. Um, so, but through it all, you, you start to do, discover. Um, and you have plenty of time to discover um, what you want to do. There's no time pressure. And you can do, I've had people, you know, do three co-ops, finish in four years, change their majors a couple times, and they're still fun. Great, thank you. This one is actually going to um, go to you as well, because it's a little bit of a follow up. Um, we have some students who are wondering how the this psychology program might prepare them if they want to work in clinical or so, uh, school psychology, and what kind of opportunities oh. exist for those kind of career paths. I think this is a perfect department for that. Um, so I, myself, I'm a clinical psychologist and Dr. Sharp um, does clinical work as well um, as a therapist and psychoanalyst. Um, so I think in order to go into that clinical field, you need that research experience. And here in the psychology department, you get all that lab experience, but then you also have the opportunity to just go on co-op um, where you can pursue further research experience and clinical work. Um, so our program really gives you the foundation to make you very competitive when you apply to graduate programs in clinical um, kind of settings. Because um, it, it is very competitive, but our students do very well because when they graduate, they have publications, they have presentations, they have all this experience um, that other students, you know, have to squeeze in during summer break or winter break and things like that. Um, so this is an ideal program to give you what you need to be competitive for clinical programs. I don't know if you want to add anything more, Dr. Sharp. Um, I would just add, in addition, the thing that I found that I think our students who want to go that route um, have found that the co-op experience is so unique because many of them you know, before they even get their bachelor's are working in clinical settings and local hospitals, group homes, and getting like firsthand experience that quite honestly, students um, in, from other schools don't get that kind of like, you know, I, yes, I worked for 35, 40 hours a week in a setting for six months or something like that. And, and it looks really good. Plus, I know many of the students, because I also teach one of the seminars at the end of their time at Northeastern have continued working in some of these places beyond like they've been hired to kind of work part time. And so they just have a lot more experience so that if you want to go out and do some kind of milieu work in, in those settings, you can with your bachelor's degree or as, as the kind of question originally started with, if you want to go on the grad school, your application really looks head and shoulders above the others. Yes. And, and I want to add that uh, the counseling, the applied counseling uh, department has added a plus one in school psychology. So basically you kind of start to take graduate courses during your senior year um, at Northeastern and then you do an additional year of courses. Now with the school psychology because of licensing requirements, it still requires a little bit more after that five year um, in order to be eligible for licensure. But so there is a pathway to go into the school psych um, plus one program. Wonderful. And speaking of plus ones, we've had a couple of questions. So can you also tell us about the plus one um, with ABA that ties into students' psychology undergraduate major? Mm -hmm. Sharp? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, for both school psych and ABA, I, I'm the contact. And so what we would do is um, just to make sure everyone knows, the ABA means like you start taking grad courses as an undergraduate. And so within five years, you get both your 
your uh, bachelor's degree after four, and then in one more, the plus one more year, you get a master's. And so for people who are interested in those specific fields, it's kind of a nice way. And again, because of the flexibility in the psych program, what we allow people to do is start planning right off the bat, um, uh, right off the bat with like, okay, this is, this is where you're going to take these courses so that when you get to this point, now here's where you're plugging in your either ABA courses, or if you're going the school psychology route. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining that. It's pretty unique to Northeastern. So it's always good to let them understand what that looks like. Um, so we heard Raina talk about being a five-year student. Um, but we have some questions about, can you graduate in four years? And Marina, I believe that you are planning a four-year track. So can you just speak a little bit about how many co-ops you're intending, how you kind of figured out that you could graduate in four years, just what your processes looked like? Yes, so I am graduating actually this semester. Um, it has been also a little bit of a travel for myself. I actually came in as a behavioral neuroscience major. Um, so I had planned out my classes to complete my BNS degree um, in four years. Um, then I went on my first co-op, which was at Judge Baker Children's Center, which is an outpatient mental health clinic for adolescents and children. And that changed my mind. I ended up switching to psychology. Um, and then I met with a couple of my advisors to kind of help me plan out what the next two and a half years would look like, um, sorry, two years would look like um, to make sure I would graduate in the four years. I ended up doing two co-ops, uh, two full-time co-ops. I ended up having to take a couple of summer classes just to maintain that, but otherwise it's been pretty an easy, straightforward path to graduating in four years if you kind of put in the work to do it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so yeah, lots of our students graduate in four years. So it's, it's and you can do it even if you decide as, that you're changing your major up at some point while you're here. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, sorry, I have dogs in the background. If you can hear the click clack, I apologize to the audience. Um, so Dr. Uh, Suzeski, could you talk a little bit about the combined majors in general? Uh, someone is asking about psychology and economics in particular, but really sort of how this all, um, how it works, why a student would choose a combined major over maybe a full psychology major? Absolutely. So again, there's our combined major. So it's different than doing a double major because we're really creating a pedagogy that makes sense when we're, you know, to combine these two um, and intersect these two disciplines. Um, and there's a bridge course. And so like when you, and I'm going to call on door later because he's doing the economics piece of this. Um, so, you know, some people are really interested in like pursuing a behavioral economics, um, maybe graduate study. As we know, as you can see in this world and the stock market goes up and down, up and down every day in this past year, I mean, we're not always a rational human beings. And sometimes, you know, that affects our decision-making and that affects our, you know, choices on, you know, what we're buying and, you know, what we're investing in and whatnot. So, you know, so those, some people are interested in pursuing, you know, more of a combination of how psychology influences economics. Um, our business, you know, um, combined major with psychology. There, you know, there it's in business, you're dealing with people. Um, you're managing people and personalities or you're marketing to people. Um, so a lot of people want to know about the psychology in order to be better business um, managers or marketers. Um, and whatnot. Um, criminal justice people, I've had people um, do the combined CJ psych and go into the FBI because they're interested in becoming a profiler. You know, I think all the shows SVU and all of that uh, criminal minds has inspired a whole uh, plethora of students interested in that. Um, so, and like, as we've seen political science and psychology, we see how, again, people are people and it, 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 they intersect with different disciplines. So, uh, you know, you may not know that you want to do a combined major yet. Um, so you start off as a psych major and then you start to take courses in political science. Or you start to take courses in economics and you're like, wow, okay, I can see how this path is really engaging for me. Um, so those opportunities are there for you. 
Um, George, did you want to talk about the economics piece? Yeah. Um, uh, to add to everything that Dr. Sazeski said, um, I, I transferred to Northeastern as a psych major, and I was overwhelmed with the amount of possibilities and things that you can have. And I was kind of like a kid in a candy store. And I tried to do everything and try to, uh, and I was actually, I spoke to uh, Dr. Sharp and Dr. Sazeski to kind of like learn what I should do. And I found that uh, there's uh, so much flexibility in the major that you can kind of hit everything that you're looking for in addition to the co-op that will provide even more experience. And actually, actually last semester at Dr. Sharp's class, I discovered behavioral economics. Um, and I fell in love with the field and I decided to pursue a cluster in behavioral economics, um, which Dr. Zazeski mentioned is classes outside of the psych uh, program that you can take. And I am now going to go on co-op that will um, engage in behavioral economics in a, with a startup and kind of like help them uh, in that field. And, and I'm, I decided to do a cluster instead of a combined major. That's through the recommendations because you can still have all of the other things as well. You can add in a minor, you can add in uh, many things. You could do research at the same time and you end up with all of the ex experience you want and you end up being able to choose where you wanna go later and still have everything that you need in order to get there. Great, thank you, Dor. Uh, this next question is for Carter. So you're the president of the psychology club, correct? I heard that correctly. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about that club in general and also just any other ways that you've sort of been involved on campus outside of the classroom? Yeah, of course. So um, I have been the president of the psych club for about a year now, um, but been in involved for a little over two years. Uh, Dr. Sharp, actually Dr. C got me in contact with Dr. Sharp at a welcome event and kind of forced me into the club and I'm very happy they did. It was a great decision. Um, so the club meets uh, every other Wednesday. Uh, normally when we're in person, we get to meet in the psych commons um, which is in Nightingale Hall, if any of you have gotten a chance to join to join us on campus for a tour. Um, but it's a great time to kind of get together with all the psych students because we all have very different degrees. We're not necessarily having multiple classes with the same people like you would in maybe like a physical therapy major where you're taking the same classes with your same cohort for the whole four years. Um, so we cover a bunch of different things. We always have a panel about co-op opportunities, possibly research opportunities as well. Um, we'll do definitely a mental health day. So uh, this past fall, uh, our club actually ended up falling on the World Mental Health Day. So we had a focus on BIPOC mental health and how to support uh, our BIPOC friends, um, especially as they're severely underrepresented group um, in the psychology field at times. Um, and we do a bunch of fun stuff as well. So we'll have like coloring events at the end of the year where it's like, just take your time and color. Um, we've come up with a great idea just today that we're gonna have a professor battle of uh, behavioralism versus psychoanalysis and kind of discuss their opinions on that. So it's a great club. Um, we're normally in person. So we have catering normally. So that's a great plug if you want a free meal as a broke college student. Um, but if not, we're also really fun on uh, Zoom. So it's a great club to get involved with. Um, and I can put our email in the chat if you would like to reach out to us, um, but also Dr. C and Dr. Sharp could get you involved with us. Um, but Besides that, I do a lot on campus. I'm an ambassador for the College of Science. Um, I'm also an Explore program peer mentor and coordinator and teaching assistant. So I work with first year Explore students. So maybe some of you guys um, during their first semester. Um, and I also was involved in a, uh, so, uh, the Sexual Assault Response Coalition, which is a activist group on campus. And I've also been a photographer for the Huntington News, which is the student newspaper. So there's a ton of opportunities to get involved, um, even with things you may not even know exist or you may not know that you're interested in them. So it's great to, there's just so many opportunities, both in person and virtual. Um, so yeah, very exciting. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Well, we're almost out of time, but I would like to invite everyone of our panelists to maybe take just a few seconds and offer uh, a piece of advice to the admitted students who are with us tonight, um, whether that's you know um, in their pursuit of psychology or or for college in general. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Brenhaus, um, and then I'll call you out as you, and then you can give us your advice. Sure. So with regard to um, what I was talking about in terms of research opportunities, I can definitely um, encourage you when you get to Northeastern or if you wind up elsewhere, um, we hope you're here. Um, once you get here, uh, I would encourage you to find find laboratories, find research that's going on that, that light you up, that, that, that you are interested in, um, even if you're not sure what research really means, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're interested at all in what research looks like and whether you might actually enjoy it, whether it might be something that you want to do, um, reach out to faculty members. Don't be, don't be scared to just cold email um, any faculty member that runs a lab that you, you find interesting because we are all very happy to hear from you. Um, even and if we don't have room in our lab, we'd still be happy to hear from you and just chat with you about our research. So go ahead and reach out um, whenever, whenever you get here and whenever you find a lab you're interested in. Great advice, thank you. Uh, why don't we go to Dr. Bex? Do you have a piece of advice for our students? Uh, my, my advice was the same as Heather's. So, um, but yeah, reach out and try lots of different things. Uh, we love to talk about our work. Um, you know, it's, it's rare that we get invited to talk about it. Um, and try try things that you're not expecting to like, because as Dr. Chizeski said, you can you can surprise yourself in um, in finding things that you weren't expecting to like, and it may end up being your career. Excellent advice, thank you. Uh, how about Dr. Sharp? Do you have something to leave uh, the audience with? Um, red velvet with uh, the the cream cheese chips are really my favorite and and bribing does work um no but seriously like i would say like i'll try to ask it in a clinical way why would you not major in psychology it's such a good hub science every so many careers connect with people like it's a great place and so also why would you not come to northeastern um and so hope to see you in the fall excellent thank you now I know how to get on your good side. I'm filing that away. <laughs> uh, Raina, do you have a piece of advice to leave our students? Yeah, I will try to be brief because I have talked quite a lot tonight. Um, I think going off of what Dr. Beck said, just try new things. It's okay to, you know, it's fun to put yourself in situations that are a little uncomfortable. Join a club that's not something you've done. Take a class and uh, you'll find your focus and go from there. Wonderful, thank you. What about you, Dor? Can you share something with us? Yeah, I will uh, reemphasize some, uh, some of the stuff that Dr. Sharp said that uh, if you're coming to Northeastern as a psychology major, obviously you need to keep an open mind and it's such a flexible degree and Northeastern offers so many opportunities with academically and beyond that it's really, it's gonna be hard for you to not uh, to not be engaged with everything that you have. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Marina, do you wanna leave the audience with something? Yeah, uh, I would like to say that it's also important to remember um, not to over-focus on academics. Um, as a college student, it's very easy to only focus on your academics, but also you wanna have that balance between work and life. So make sure you hang out with friends, explore the city, explore other parts, uh, to make sure you have a good college experience overall. Excellent advice, thank you. Uh, Carter. Yeah, so kind of in a similar vein, um, my advice would be to enjoy your college years. I feel like so much of high school is, oh my gosh, how do I get to college? And then so much of college is, oh my gosh, what do I do after college? And while the co-op program is fantastic, it does put a little bit more emphasis on the future rather than the present, um, which I wouldn't change anything about my doing co-ops at Northeastern. I think it's the best way to do college. I don't know why anyone doesn't do co-ops at college, but um, yeah, like kind of what Maria said, like hang out with your friends, like be involved on campus or do what makes you happy and like appreciate being like within the college environment because it's from what I've heard very different after you graduate and you know it's um 
it's not as, life isn't as structured and um, even though college is very unstructured, it's nice to have that time. So that would be my advice. Excellent, thank you. And Dr. Szeski, we're gonna finish with you. So give us something good. Uh, oh, the pressure's on. Yeah, no uh, pressure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, going off on what Carter said, you know, again, sometimes you get to focus on the end goal and not the journey. Um, and there's so much to just enjoy in the journey. And with that, I just, in my first piece of advice is just pause and reflect right now. Cause you know, your big decisions are, you know, you know, right there that you have to make. And it can be, you might not be pausing and reflecting on all the accomplishments that have brought you to this place and congratulating yourselves and just being in that moment and just relishing the fact that you're so awesome. So that would be my first thing is just pause and reflect on how great you are. Um, but my other great piece of advice is go to office hours. We love our students. We like to interact with you. And a lot of times, it, like I sit in my office and would love for people to come. Well, not now, but um, in the fall, I'll be in my office. So really go, just go in and chat and just say, hey, <laughs> you know, what you doing? You know, what, what are your thoughts on this? And we just really crave that interaction with students. And um, so that would be, don't be afraid to go to office hours. We, we want you to come to office hours. Excellent advice. Well, um, that concludes our evening. So I wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists for coming and sharing your stories today. Hopefully uh, the students in the audience got some really good information to help them make their decisions. Um, and we wish you all the best of luck and a wonderful night and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And email me or Dr. Sharp or any of us if you have any questions. Enjoy the weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye.